Meeting is being recorded. Tonight we're going to talk about current issues and impacts you're going to hear out from different 
um, parties that we have assembled today and, and departments and agencies. So it's just going to be kind of to the work, kind of a level the opportunity so that we all have the same information so we can make really good informed decisions. Um, motorized, non motorized use. And, and what are those conflicts potentially? Um, we are going to be working actively managing our resource and how we road. The impacts of those, the maintenance of those, the accessibility of them, projects that are going on in public works, those are all things that play into our decision um, and, and just gathering information. Um, and this really allows for the whole purpose tonight is to allow for a very collaborative approach um, with the city, the county, and the stakeholders. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about land use, and you may immediately say, well, those are zoned, but I think there is a significance um, in the connection. They're, they're obviously very interconnected. And so if you look in the land use regulations in 2016, we adopted um, a process, a conditional use process for outfitting and guiding. And those um, uses are conditionally allowed wherever they are allowed in the county. They are prohibited within the industrial mining area. And that was a very intentional land use decision. And it was very much based on um, health and safety, first of all. Because of the inherent dangers that are present within the IM zone district, um, it was recognized by the planning commission and the board of county commissioners that this was an area that needed to be very sensitive about the use of land. The other item is that potential for trespass. There is um, a very diverse ownership and mine space of a lot of overlap. And so getting off the county roads um, in the IAM zone district, you're immediately typically trespassed onto private property. So those were really the reasons that outfitting and guiding in the industrial mining zone district, so I'm talking about all of the PE sites um, outside the city limits, um, was intentionally zoned um, as a prohibited zone from outfitting and guiding. The areas of operation that are allowed within the county are Ag Forestry, Ag Residential, and Recreational. Those were areas that felt more consistent with land uses in that area to allow outfitting and guiding. So, whereas roads and land are treated differently, um, I do believe that it's important to at least consider the alignment of zoning and other ways um, and their impacts to the adjacent lands that they serve. Um, next slide, please. And so I'm going to turn it now to Bryce Ehrlich, who is our mapping director, and he's going to identify um, the areas that we're going to be talking about. All right, thank you. So, yeah, I'm just going to give an overview uh, of the county and just general areas where we're seeing either conflicts um, or these issues come up. So, this is Lake County. Um, the biggest thing I've decided in Lake County is that 75% of property of the county is public land. Um, so any sort of decision decisions we make are going to have you know federal agencies involved or at least affected. Um, and so we look at you know trying to create something that in partnership with them so we can create a holistic solution. But it's worth noting that the black lines here on this map are county roads, and that's what the ordinance that we're talking about tonight applies to. It's just the black line. So in the light green is Florida Service land. We also have some BLM land in the county. Anything in white though is the remaining private land in the county. You can see what those those that are gray. Those public lands have some issues at play though. There's congressionally designated wilderness areas, and there's also roadless areas at play here too. So you can see in the darker greens, you have other areas that have other federal regulations. There's also a small area on the Mosquito um, Range Crest. That's an area of critical environmental concern that the BLM is identifying. Uh, given the given the topography and the terrain and the issues at hand in those wilderness areas, the Woodrow Ranger District has divided Lake County and the rest of the district, which includes parts of Chapey, into outfitter guide compartments for regulation purposes. So. This is kind of their side of the token where they're going to meet us and into this discussion. Uh, so, yeah, the Leadville East side is an area where we see lots of non motorized and motorized use, recreationalist, commercial driving, all the above. 
Um, so you can see in the east side on this map it really shows that that brown outline is industrial mining zone area. The entire east side of Woodville, all the way to the county border on the Mosquito Ridge Crest is all industrial mining. You can see though that if you exit any one of the black lines, you're most likely automatically on private land. There's a mishmash of mining claims, lots of jungle borders in there, um, you know, historic remnants of our mining boom days. Another issue at play here is in the east side, we also have groom trails. So if our Assembly Association local chapters have grooms and trails in the winter time, those are highlighted in my blue. Um, some environmental concerns that the east side presents, though, and why this remains is up to mining zoning is every black line in here is a mining impact, either a mine shaft, a prospect pit, or some other bit of mining history that's left um, that needs to be addressed or at least considered. And then you also, it's really hard to see on this screen, but there's a light blue area that represents part of the water district's uh, basins that they catch water and take the water from. So this entire area, you have multiple environmental issues at play. Um, another popular area for non-motorized, motorized, recreational, and commercial use is the Turtle Road area. This is another area that has a lot of county roads around that are used in the summer months. And then if you see in the blue, the highlighted, those are Groom Snowmobile Trails by Colorado Snowmobile Association. Um, mostly forest service land in this area, though, but the county roads are maintained and managed by the county. Then you also see there's some private lands and a bit of BLM on the south side of the road that's leading to this. And another issue, or you know, another consideration with this area that, is that there's already multiple boot camps. Um, you know, about 10 mountain boot and huts are up there. And there's also multiple guide and outdoor operations, audio and physical operations. And that's it. Okay. Any questions on that? Are we good for questions? Um, yeah, yeah. I'll hand it off. Road Thank you, everybody. Um, so I'm here to, tonight to talk about the problems that, that we Road and Bridge has with OHB, snow builds, um, and stuff like that. Winter and summer, we did have to deal with it. So, um, wintertime use by snow cats, snow builds, and passenger vehicles go places they shouldn't. <laughs> um, so, when we're planning, you know, we have problems with planning and opening closed roads. Um, open road, opening road access to things that we have closed is to, basically for safety reasons, to keep people out of those areas, especially at line prone areas, um, or around Turquoise Lake, basically to keep cars from going over the dam. We have cars that get stuck there every year. I've had cars go as far as up to um, the parking areas in Ontario Pass before they get stuck because of the green trails up there. Um, opening access to private property. Um, there are people that live on Turquoise Lake across the dam that have to use a snow to get to their house in the wintertime because it is closed. Um, opening roads that are contracted to be groomed. Um, the results are endangering you know, endanger employees and the general public because people get stuck back there. We don't know they're there. But, Either have to walk out or they get stuck again. Um, the one that hanging with past, they spent 14 hours up there trying to get out. They ended up having to walk out to get help. And what, they had to leave one person up there. So, this is a, a picture of showing one road that was open, plowed open, so a car could actually drive up that and get over the snow berm that we create there. Um, a parking lot that's opened on private property. Um, when we plow the roads, we leave a berm along the side of the road that helps plow drivers where the edge of that road is. In this picture, that berm was moved out, um, leaving our drivers and our plow drivers accessible to running off the road because they know that that berm is set there at the edge of the road. Um, so in summertime, 
silage fees and ATVs, the passion of vehicles, four by fours. Um, we deal with gravel roads, paved roads, and parking lots, and you know, they all get some kind of abuse. Um, parking lot, a bunch of roads <coughs> being done in the parking lot. Usually costs about five hundred to a thousand dollars every time you have to grade that parking lot because of that. Um, not good use of your money or mine. Um, this is on a paved road. I'm not saying it's no way to see it, it's back in the vehicle probably, but you know that is leaving rubber on our roads and also tearing them up. I can show you pictures in a parking lot where they actually tore the asphalt up right there on the. From that blue car is where they tore asphalt up out of the parking lot. Um, the edge of roads are being exposed with people going off the road or coming onto the asphalt, which tears up the asphalt road as well as leaves the road open to erosion damage. That's just another picture of some of it. Um, going around corners, I was up there actually today and took this picture going around corners on the dirt road and not slowing down for them. But in and out when they go around them. Um, also leaving areas open to erosion. Some more pictures. Some more pictures. So in conclusion, basically, you know, recreation is good for all. I'm, I'm for it. I do it for myself. I go out and, and do all this kind of stuff too. Um, I think we just need to determine now how to keep it from being such a cost or a burden on the county. Um, that's pretty much where I'm at. I believe that recreation is good and we need it and we just need to control how it's done a little bit. Hey Mark, I have a question. Could you go back to the slide and point out what the road zones are? Which roads they are? Yeah, like where the F picture was taken. This was off the bypass this morning. Off the bypass? Yeah, so it, it gets it too. That one's up in the um, mining district on actually 1A, I believe. That's in the mining district on 3B. That's in the mining district off of 7th Street, just before the. Um, Bike path. That's on um, McQuiffy Drive, right over here, right by the cemetery. That's Community Park. That one, I believe, is County Road 11 and 11A. Community Park by the rodeo ground. That's just a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Adam Ducharme with our um, tourism and our tourism office. Um, I'm with the Tourism County uh, Overseeing Personal and Commercial Use Regulations Adapt. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, so, yeah, if you want to go ahead and put them on me. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I'm just going to present kind of case studies. These are all our neighboring communities, and I've now had an opportunity to speak with someone either from you know a, a land management or board of county commissioners or uh, somebody that represents tourism in our neighboring communities and sort of our commercial outfitters uh, so the first case study is eagle county uh, eagle county uh, decided in working with rocky mountain sports riders which is a local nonprofit uh, in their community that helps advocate for ohd and trail use uh, they decided to create four trail areas for OHD. Uh, uh, Bucko Mountain, Akavi, Hard Scrabble, and Green Gate. And these are four areas where OHD use is allowed. And then also in 2017, the county leased land for uh, Rocky Mountain Sports Riders to create a moto track. So that's a picture of the moto track. It's not dissimilar to what we have here in Leadville. Uh, and basically, access to county roads is to and from these areas of recreation. Uh, and travel, as I mentioned, is limited to these county, ro county roads that bring you to these areas of recreation. Uh, and Rocky Mountain Sports Riders kind of helps 
work with the local community to maintain the trail system as well as um, maintain all the programming that happens at the motor trail. Uh, Garfield County is another one. Uh, in 2016, they created an ordinance uh, that helped institute a, a master trail network. So it's on a mix of BLM, Forest Service, and county roads, uh, access to OHVs. And again, OHV access is limited to those network of roads, county roads that bring you to and from these recreation points. Um, and all of, you know, kind of hard to see the map, right? But in all of those spots in blue are areas where OHV use is not allowed. And then some of the other dotted lines are areas where there's a trail network for OHV use. Uh, this is Rio Blanco County. Uh, this is, <clears throat> many of you might know this uh, as the Wagon Wheelers OHV Trail Network. Uh, this is Wrangley and Meeker, and this is a community that has wholly embraced uh, OHV use. They are considered the OHV Mecca of Colorado, and they are promoted as such through the Colorado Tourism Office. Uh, they have over 600 miles of designated trails for OHV use. Um, even with that, they have three guiding slash rental services in their county uh, that operate uh, OHVs outside of for zones. And then uh, the next county is our next our neighbors, Jamie County. Uh, they have uh, they work with the Friends of Four Mile, um, and they help sort of navigate the recreation areas for OHV use. Jamie County, they've kind of taken it an agnostic approach to recreation, uh, where no one type of recreation is, um, you know, gets any special consideration above the rest. Uh, and within JP County, there are a number of trail advocacy groups. So you have your, your hiker group, your mountain bike group, um, your OHV group, and they all sort of work with the Friends of Four Mile and the local land managers to create information um, and access the areas of recreation and in Jamie County, they have very similar regulations where, with county, when it comes to county roads, where county road access is allowed for OHVs to travel to and from areas of recreation. And then uh, Clear Creek County is my last case study I found, uh, and it's an example of an area where they have over 100 miles of use for motorized and non motorized. And um, the Tourism Bureau has worked with local land managers and businesses, um, guiding services, et cetera, to identify areas that are sort of promoted for OHVs and understood as areas where OHVs are, are sort of allowed and encouraged, and then other areas that are for other types of recreation on the rest specifically. So they have a, a, a trail strike task force, which is managed by the county. And is used to help um, understand trail irrigation and signage and work on trail maintenance and things like that. Um, and they're also currently involved in a, a ROM, which is basically a recreation management plan to help understand use uh, and understand what, what areas need to be considered to be closed down, other areas that can be opened uh, for different types of recreation use. And yeah, you know, my last slide is just basically, you know, as we think about this and as we think about types of recreation that we want to prioritize, you know, that that's kind of why we're all here tonight is to try and understand from everyone in our community how we should prioritize uh, OHP recreation. Because, you know, as we talk about, if you're an area that does not have an understanding or a set of rules in place, then we're an area that could be exploited. So that's our, our job. To, work together to understand how we can come up with a set of regulations that make sense. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, next is the Lake County Sheriff's Office uh, at the Indian Sheriff's Department. So this, uh, Caleb was going to speak, but I don't know if he's not available. Available, do you have anything to share? Uh, yeah, he's not available tonight. Um, but he was asked on directly to me to uh, do some sort of presentation for the Sheriff's Office at this point. No, I have no honor. Yeah, but if, uh, if the time is right for questions, I'll be on. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next is Lori Simonson from Lee City. 
the city administrator from um, and your own account is the logo. So. Well, I want to thank the council for including the city in this conversation. Uh, go to the next slide. So I'd like to start at the beginning. Uh, I always like to know what, what we're talking about and what the rules are. So the, the first thing I like to start with is the definition. So uh, Colorado State Parks and Wildlife, they have these nice little pictures here in case you don't have time to read. But this is what, this is what we're talking about. These, this is OHB. Okay, so I'm not going to read everything to you, but you can see we, we've got four different types of uh, machines. There will probably be more. Uh, I expect there will be a three wheel type machine coming out at some point. But uh, if you. Oh, sorry, we're having trouble seeing the slides on this account. Okay. Just one second. I can do some whole music for us if you'd like. <laughs> You can just hit from, can you hit from the beginning? There you go. And then I think you just page over page down. It's not popping up on the share screen. Oh. This isn't going to count as my time. Right? <laughs> Yes. 
while we're waiting, but like, there might be some people that's, that are still in the waiting for the next phase. Sure. We can go to the next. All right. So the we'll start with the highest level. Uh, state regulations. What is required to operate an OHB in Colorado? So <clears throat> you um, either must you have a registration card uh, and two decals or an OHB permit to operate in Colorado. So this is Colorado Parks and or Parks and Wildlife regulates this, and it includes well in routes. Uh, in staging areas on public lands and OHB designated trails. So now, uh, how does the city involved in this? Th this is the city's current ordinance, and I'm going to condense it for you. What this says is you can drive from point A to point B. That's, that's really what all this says. Um, so it, it, in Colorado, right now, the state law says uh, OHBs are, are banned on streets and roads and highways, unless a local jurisdiction decides to allow them and under what circumstances. So right now, the state law says no, but this is our way of saying yes. So within the city, the city has said you can operate OHVs from point A to point B. And uh, actually, I wanted to make one other point about the regulation of, um, or registration of OHVs. So in 2021, Colorado Parks and Wildlife had 200 and about 204,000 registered OHVs, 46,000 of those came from out of state. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So a couple of the restrictions that are, that are, I didn't include them all, but a couple of these are important for our city limits, okay? So um, now that you know this, 16 years um, and older, okay? You can operate and uh, 25 miles per hour, okay? Those are basic safety regulations, and I'll get to that uh, why that's important in just a second. Okay. Oh, back. So, why are we talking about this? So, the impacts of OHVs within the city is slightly different than the impact within the county, right? So, the city doesn't have any land that OHVs are going to recreate on within the city limits. What the city is is the pass-through point. It's the pass-through point to get to places. And so what a lot of rural communities are finding is that uh, they're inundated with pass-through traffic. And so they're, they're, the cities are trying to find a balance between welcoming tourists, welcoming traffic, and not turning into a, a free-for-all. And so uh, that's what a lot of municipalities have been struggling. Uh, so one time, I mean, you may know about this tin cup. Um, it has, there's a, there's a quote at one of the articles I read, overrun with 25 vehicle long caravan of OHVs. So well, that's not us. That is uh, the fact that we do be facing. It sounds like somebody's not on. Okay. 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 Um, uh, next slide, please. So impacts within the city. The, the main impacts within the, the city, and this is different than what the, the county's uh, impacts are, are, I think, Generally, in this type of priority, noise, safety, and traffic slash congestion. So, noise. So, uh, ATVs are louder than a passenger vehicle. That, that's that's just how they are. Um, they probably the newest ones run about 91 decibels. You get older vehicles that are manufactured uh, earlier that have a lot of miles on them. You may be talking a lot more than that. You may be talking so the Forest Service. Limits are 96 decibels, but 91 decibels for a brand new type of machine. Um, that's assuming it's not electric. Electric drops down to virtually nothing. But the, the engines are louder, um, they're not the case, and the tires are bigger, and the tires are louder. So, generally, just a louder type of vehicle. So, what, what can an or that city do? Well, you can pass a sound ordinance. Um, you, can regulate, you can regulate decibels. 
you need resources for that. You would need sound meter equipment and you would need uh, personnel to enforce any type of an ordinance. Um, the other type of remedy for this is, is many communities have opted out of allowing uh, uh, AGs and OHDs within the city, which bottom line means trailer. They would need to be trailered to the trailhead. There's, there's impacts that that causes. How much, how much parking are there at the trailhead? How, how many vehicles can you accommodate? Um, if it's truly an outside the community issue, a lot of those vehicles were trailered here to begin with, right? So if, if they're, you know, if they're trailers to the trailhead, you know, people have brought their trailers there. Again, many locals may not be trailering their, their vehicles to the trailhead. They may be point A to point B getting them. So safety. One of the things the city has heard a lot about are safety concerns. Underage uh, folks on, you know, in vehicles, no helmets, no protective gear, speeding. So safety issues are a big issue for the city. I mean, we are in charge of health and safety. That's one of our primary jurisdictions within the city. So education, right? Some communities have a no before you go OED um, type of education campaign. Some OED rental companies are requiring their uh, ranchers to watch a video before they go. So education is a big component of it. Um, and uh, that some of that some of those resources are available, and then of course enforcement. Uh, we need law enforcement to be able to enforce the the, the laws that we have on the books: 25 miles an hour and uh, um, basically no underage drivers. So traffic and congestion. That's the number of that's just the number of users, right? So so we were talking about some communities that have been overrun with visitors. I mean, that, that's the bottom line is, um, and the, essentially there's ways that you can, I mean, there's not ways you can limit the number of, of visitors per se, but you can look at business licensing, right? So currently we have two ATV rental, OHD rental companies within city limits, right? Some communities have put a moratorium on new businesses. That, that's one way to limit the number of um, machines in use. You could also limit the number Instead of number of businesses, you can limit the number of machines. So you can say new businesses come in, but they're capped at a certain number of new machines. Or the machine has to be quiet. Or they might have to require education campaigns. That's all something that city can do through business licensing. Um, we apparently have some sort of bagpipe plan. <laughs> uh, and then the other is just designated routes. Some cities have done designated routes, which is when you get to point A to point B, these are the streets you need to use. These are the streets that ATVs, OHVs are allowed on. That's great, unless you happen to live on one of those streets and you don't want your street to be designated route. So that's a, that's a big discussion that you know, the community may need to have. The cost of that, of course, signs and enforcement. So our impacts within the city limits are a little bit different than the counties. And so I want to just kind of highlight, I think there are probably other um, concerns people may have. So I put my contact information up there. I put my email in the little tiny type, so you don't have to call me. Um, but the, the bottom line is, these are issues that other communities are struggling with because they have become overrun. I, I think what we're, the city is trying to do is make sure we're sort of ahead of that. Um, I think that you know while we have some issues, safety issues, Maybe some noise issues, we can we can handle those, but we want to get ahead of the curve on those. So that thank you. Um coming back to Anne, um options on my current H O H D ordinance and path forward. Um uh, Anne and Michael Irwin. So I think um, tonight has been a really great sharing of information, the case studies, looking at what other communities have done. Um, a lot of those are going to be really uh, instrumental in helping make some decisions moving forward. Um, thank you, Lori. She's, she's provided um, some great information and some ways the city and the county uh, potentially can work together. Um, there's definitely an um, opportunity for collaboration there. So um, some other management options, just 
looking at the tools the community has, that the decision makers have in managing this use. Um, one thing that could happen could simply rescind the ordinance, um, like it was pointed out, um, and just go with state law and not provide the allowance locally. Um, I don't think that that's an overwhelming, um, probably favorable thing to do, but, but it's an option. Um, permitting process, looking at a permitting process that has maybe a certain amount of user days, maybe using the uh, forest service model for special use permits. Um, looking at that model, looking at our special abyss process uh, that we currently have in Lake County, that we identify and potentially mitigate any kind of impact, an annual review. Uh, those would be examples of a permitting process. Um, we definitely, we could also determine point A and point B. That would be that identification, classification, and maintenance. And that was really present in a lot of the case studies that Adam shared this evening. So that'd be another element. Um, and through this process, we really want to make sure that it includes critical community partners. That's the city and county collaboration. Um, that I think after um, thinking this through, there's a lot of overlap there and a belief that we can complement um, with our regulations and our consideration of this. Public land partners, user groups, and public input. We want all of this going in and available as management options for the decision makers. Next slide. So just the creation of a permitting process, what would that look like? The permitting process could be first starting with the identification of roads, impacts, and maintenance, uh, working with public works, looking at those case studies, looking at what other communities have done. It's always been a really good deal. Lessons learned from other communities, the way that they are, are addressing these impacts and also serving the recreational needs of the community. Coordinate with the city of Leadville, the business license, referral communication, really keeping those lines of communication open and working together collaboratively. Uh, research models. I already spoke a little bit about the special use permit from the US Forest Service. They have a very specific process for considering special use permits of Forest Service roads. Looking at our internal special event permit, potentially user days, impact days, so we're just element of reviewing a permitting process. And the administration of it, most likely this would be something that community development and planning would oversee. Um, they would, uh, there would be determination of what kind of if a permit was available. What is an equitable fee establishment on that? Making sure that we have a fully vetted referral agency process, identifying who our key stakeholders are and making sure that those permits are fully vetted and referred to those agencies. Um, annual permits and receive updates on what's working. Maybe there is an annual review. Maybe you're eligible for a renewal, or maybe based on a series of uh, items, um, maybe that eligibility isn't available annually. And then the ability to conditionally manage. So with all of our special event permits, we have the ability to look at different things. We look at projects going out in, on, on our county roads, things that we may have to address. Maybe there's signage, maybe there's whatever, whatever mitigating factors that we could bring in to allow the users to have the ability to do that through this process. So these are just kind of identifying some tools some things that the, the decision makers have available to them to try to come out with an equitable decision for the community, which absolutely supports the health, safety, and welfare of our community. Uh, just like Lori mentioned, that, that's the outcome that we're looking for. And uh, I think we're very interested in hearing public input. So I'll turn it over to the board and uh, unless there's any questions. Um, Uh, just on Bryce's map, the area highlighted in orange on the right side. <laughs> um, I don't know. That's the area of critical environmental concern, correct? Designated mm -hmm. by BLM. Yep. Okay. And it spans in the county as well. Can we ask questions? Um, we're going to open it for public comment in just a second. Just have a comment. Um, does any Michael, more any additional questions for anyone? 
No money for me. Um, does anybody need to sign up to be late? Um, I, I had a question. I think it, maybe Laurie knows on the city. So you talked about the register, you know, the, the um, registration requirements for OHD dirt bikes. Do, do you know, like, so what's the difference between like street legal or like on street registration for bikes versus you know bikes that would really be out on the trail? Or something like that? So uh, in under the state. Regulations: The vehicle needs to have a front light and a rear light, and uh, safety belts have to be in use if there are safety belts. But they, I mean, so theoretically, that is uh, within our jurisdiction. That would be street legal. We also have to have insurance, right? And the city has a. Uh, you know, essentially a waiver of liability if you're using the city streets as long as as long as you have a uh, the front rear light. But what's the, so there's been, that's raised an interesting point. So uh, two of the ATV manufacturers associations have uh, basically put in writing that they have not created these vehicles to be street legal. They they are not intended to be a passenger vehicle. They're not intended to transport people around town. Uh, and mainly, I think they say that because of liability issues. Um, they don't have the crash protection that a passenger vehicle does. Um, they're not in case like a passenger vehicle does. I mean, if you, you're in an ATV and you're hit by a Ford F-150, you're probably going to figure out who's going to sustain the most damage. <clears throat> Um, I one follow-up question for Brian. Um, with that BLM piece of land, is there anything, any kind of literature that goes with that? Or that would make recommendations today. I'm not too sure. I know designated areas on the maps. Okay. And all it says is an area of critical environmental concern. Um, it's mostly covering the BLM land, but not the private land. And then I had a question um, from Adam's presentation. You mentioned, I forget what county it was, but they had, I think it was called ominously the strike task force. Um, that's not a little bit of a but um, is that is, is that county employees? Is that like nonprofit employees? And so then how is that funded? And, and also, I mean, did they start their name? I mean, did they have, are they more like ambassadors, like giving out information? Did they have, a, when you say enforcement, I mean, they, they're not post certified law enforcement officers. So, how, how does that chain of you know, enforcement work? Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's Clear Creek County. Um, and it, it was a, an, an ambassador program where they work with local land managers and law enforcement to sort of understand use and potential uh, conflicts in their given areas <clears throat> of recreation. And then just this year, they actually hired someone who's seated in the county to manage that. Um, and so then they're managing ambassadors, volunteers mostly, but as well as contract work. Um, and they're doing, it, it is mostly to identify areas that where there is um, either conflict or, or um, degradation, environmental degradation, and you know, uh, temporarily close off areas, maintenance, uh, fixed, um, areas of concern, things like that. But it is seated, uh, and then it's a, a manager within the county. But, but then they refer the law enforcement for any actual That's right. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I, I think that's there. Is a representative online from BM? Mm -hmm. Sean, did you online from BM? Did you hear Commissioner Marcello? Question? Oh, hi, I'm here. Uh, I'm sorry, I did not hear the question. Um, there's a, an, area, an area on the top of Mosquito Pass that is a critical environmental concern. Do you have any, can you provide us with any background or detail on that, what that designation means? Um, <clears throat> just kind of 
it's set aside as an area that has some endangered or uh, threatened or rare plant species and also is considered to be primary lynx habitat. And so it just kind of triggers some special management needs for us. But, um, you know, how that would kind of react to uh, the issue at hand, uh, I'm not sure if I could address right now, if that okay. makes sense. Another request. Okay. That's good. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, so those of you that did sign up online, uh, we'll start with uh, those that signed up um, first, and we'll just work our way down the list. Um, just as a reminder, uh, public comment is limited to three minutes. If you do have a comment that is similar to someone that has spoken previously, um, please just state that someone has already mentioned your concern. Um, so that we can keep going through things. Um, you are always welcome to send additional feedback or information to the county manager, Tim Bergman, uh, or Claire, his assistant, or to us as board members as well. Um, after the presentation this evening, there will be additional work sessions uh, on the topic uh, with the board, potentially with the climate commission, um, depending on which route. Uh, as, as the county decides to go, um, but this is just a, a place for us to have some open, honest conversation. Um, so with that, we'll start with Daniel Connolly from Level 82, if you'd like to come up or stand up. Hi, Dan. Um, I'm a Level 82 one of the two outfitters that use the east side. Um, we recently emailed the trail count. We've been taking it since January. All the people we passed while we're out on the floor, it averages around 1.2 people per day. That's eight hours a day spent on the east side. Um, as far as the east side goes, we're there every day, all day. We see how the roads change, we see how everything changes. And I could look at those pictures and just see rocks and the way the dirt is, know exactly where it is. I could tell from the fire prints, they were from my machines. Um, one corner mentioned coming off South Toledo. Uh, there is disruption from dirt and rocks, but it happens when it rains. It doesn't happen from our machines. Uh, we run the six seat machine. They come factory with 62 horsepower. They're naturally aspirated, non turbo. They have around 40 horsepower up here. We drive in four wheel drive. You can smash the gas as hard as you want. And the tires will never spin. It doesn't matter if there's one person or six in there. Um, the east side is a treasure. It draws people here from Breckenridge and Vail. Vail and Breckenridge aren't able to offer these kinds of floors. And the east side are the only ones where you can see the mines, you can see Mount Massive and Albert. People come to this community to see that stuff and you know we share it with Leadville. They often spend a lot of money when they come visit. They all park on our property. They don't park on any city streets. They show up. They commute. You know, it's not separate cars coming. It's whole groups coming. I've had thousands of people come through my door with very little impact on this community. Like we just had a bike race with a huge amount of impact. We couldn't go down Main Street. We couldn't go down back roads. And thousands of people came. And you know, maybe they spent some money. A lot of them camped. Everyone that shows up to our business spends money. They come in brand new, huge SUVs. They all go out to eat. They shop at our clothing stores. And then they leave. They're not a huge impact. They all use my bathroom. They don't stop anywhere in the bathroom. And just like I said, we use roads. As far as health and safety goes, I'd be more concerned with mining activity, disturbing dirt, mercury, cyanide in it. Not little go karts that kind of drive around, don't have any impact. Like you said, the road, those pictures, a lot of that's water runoff. That's what disturbs the environment up there. Because again, I'm there every single day, hour by hour. Um, in the snow, when we get cars driving on broom trails, yeah, I wish we had more signs. If we had more signs, that would get rid of a lot of things. I'm tired of pulling people out. We are the trail ambassadors up there. 
we are the ones that flag people down in Priuses and beg them not to go up Adrian's pass. I mean, uh, mosquito pass. We're at three minutes. Uh -huh. um, so thank you for your time. And when we get to the list, if we want to come back, we'll come back for another page. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, and again, remember to address the board with your, your public comments um, so that we don't have too much discussion between um, audience members. Um, and next on our list is Robert Frankel. Oh, so you have this? Oh, I'm reading. Are you reading? You're reading? It's on lines, but I think Um, from Robert Frigo, 410 County Road, 26 with Bates. As an avid hiker in the Colorado Trail and Continental Divide Trail, I have seen firsthand the devastation that OHVs can have on, on once impossible remote trails and historic mining roads. I have seen volunteer hikers spend countless hours trying to stabilize and improve trails to minimize erosion and, man and manage drainage to protect, protect the fragile ecosystem. Volunteers working on trails have restored eroding trails, creating Great switchbacks are less than great, and great control structures. Steps are installed to stabilize the slopes. I have not seen any concern for the roads by the OHV community. OHV rentals and sales have boomed recently, allowing people to drive into mountainous areas that were, that were too rugged for street four by four vehicles. Recommended Silverton and Granby have experienced massive devastation and erosion of their mountain routes. I have seen OHV users at 12,000 feet elevation. Drive by at 25 miles per hour, creating a trail of dust and loosening the soil. Roads have been absolutely torn up by OHVs with no feasible way to restore the damaged environment in fragile tundra areas. Roads going straight up hill are easily eroded. After numerous OHV use of the roads, these gullies are formed and the soil becomes very loose and easily eroded. I have seen that OHV users find it easier to drive the adjacent tundra rather than keep the damaged, keep the damaged roads. See the attached photos. OHV usage is occurring in very remote areas, and there is no way to police how people are using the roads. Once these areas are damaged, they're difficult to stabilize them again. OHV usage is destroying the serenity of these remote roads and trails once only visited by foot and irreparably damaging the environment. I implore, the, I implore Lake County to limit OHV usage to only areas that can be stabilized. There needs to be plan, there needs to be a plan to control areas of usage, discourage any use of timberline in the private environment. Create a maintenance plan to restore areas impacted. Hikers have very little impact on the environment, and where there are impacts, efforts are made to restore high use areas. People escape to these areas for the quiet solitude. That irreplaceable value of the outdoors is lost with uncontrolled OHV usage. Everybody would please step up to the microphone so that everybody's all our questions on online can hear as well. That'd be great. I'm never going to get through all my stuff, so I'm going to try to condense it a little bit. Um, I'm mostly concerned at this point about the city. I think the county also has a lot of issues that can be worked on and planned and discussed. And, you know, but I, what I want to talk about mostly was the city. Um, what started as a plan for point to point has been. This has just gotten out of control. Um, I agree that the noise and the safety are, are probably the biggest issues, and I have some videotapes to show what it sounds like and looks like on the trail next to the middle belt behind my house. Um, in fact, last night around 12.20, somebody rode a side-by-side -side up the middle belt, blasting their music, and in the summer, it's nice to have your windows open, but it's impossible anymore. So, um, I would like the city and the county to team up, but I would also like um, you to emphasize right now the city limits. And um, number one is noise, and I'll kind of skip that because we already talked about that. But um, the safety I've seen children on the bikes, I've seen um, speeding, I've seen wheelies, I've seen wheelies passing cars. And I saw a kid just two days ago coming down West 6, get on the upper dirt parking lot at the intermediate school, 
took off, jumped down to the park page parking lot at the intermediate school, did a wheelie, and then on County Road 4 in the Quest, he cut in front of three vehicles. Um, so I know uh, one of my neighbors called the police about a speeding dirt bike, and the policeman said, we don't chase them because it's unsafe. What if they got hurt or what if they got killed? And I'm like, well, what if the innocent bystander got injured or killed? Okay, because if we had it being illegal, that probably stops 75% of it. And then we still have to come up with ideas to stop the rest. But um, a law enforcement individual even told me the tires aren't safe, let alone the encasement around the vehicle if it ever got hit by somebody else. And I do think a lot of young kids and a lot of unhelmeted children, um, three or four on an ATV, um, riding down the street, it's, it's just really unsafe. And for us not to be able to enforce it really makes it unsafe, especially in the city. Um, soil contamination. I've also been told by Climax Mine there's a possible soil contamination, so the dirt trail next to the mineral belt and where the Carl City Farm is has contaminated soil, so that's going into the air and we're breathing that. And so is the ATV and dirt biker. Um, fire bans. Uh, fire ban says um, no operating any off road vehicles on public lands unless the vehicle is equipped with a properly installed spark arrestor. You know, they're going right behind my house and they might not have that. So it's another. Yeah, Brett, thank you so much. Okay, Katie Shepherd. <coughs> I believe it's in my phone because I can't see your last name. But um, okay. yeah, do you want to come up to the into the microphone? Hey guys, uh, Jay, I'm the owner. Jay, could you please address the board? Thanks. Hi, I'm Jay. I'm the owner of Nelson Beach Smart Hill. My husband owns Level Equipment. Uh, as Daniel. Um, so there are a couple of things I want to mention. Uh, one is obviously, as you mentioned, 0.2 percent is on average that's the people we pass today. Um, I feel like the county is putting a lot of resources and time into this effort, and I'm trying to wonder if it's absolutely necessary considering it's literally 1.2 on average that we pass. The second thing is um, talking about what the community thinks about OHB. Should the OHB be allowed to travel on county road? Actually, Harold's Democrats did a survey back in February 9th, 2022, and the result is 47.4% think OHG should be allowed to travel on county road without regulations. On, uh, about 26.3% think um, OHG should be allowed if abiding by traffic laws. About 21% uh, in total think. OHV should not be uh, uh, should not be allowed to travel on county roads, and that's the poll that Howard Democrat did, and that's I believe what our community thinks about OHVs. As of our tours, um, we stay under 25 miles an hour on the entire tour, not just on the city roads, in the county road too. And of Mosquito Pass on the Rocky Parade, we go about seven miles an hour, um, going up like that Mosquito Pass. So we're definitely not speeding, and I feel like right now the conversation sounds like the county is considering um, about regulating commercial operators. Um, but I'm wondering, um, I do see there are people speeding on OHVs, absolutely, um, but that, those are not commercial operators. So we have huge liability um, if anyone gets hurt on our tour. We've been open for a year, not on the road, we have absolutely zero accidents um, the whole time. And I feel like um, if the county is considering regulating OHG uh, for commercial uses, um, that's kind of punishing the good people for other people's mistakes. Uh, on top of that, I'm also curious about um, for the sheriff's department, uh, how many um, how many OHG um, police reports are there in general, and what's the percentage of the OHGs um, report compared to the overall. Um, police report they receive. Yeah, I don't believe that the commercial operators are the ones 
that's causing a public vendor. Uh, as of Anne's point about uh, IM zoning district is a big health and safety security um, concern. Again, this is the county road we're talking about. Um, if the commercial operators or overseas do not allow that county road, there are going to be um, people in Greece, people just out, outside of town. Normal people drive normal cars on those roads, um, regardless of if it's OHP or not. If it's a really real safety hazard, hazard health concern, I feel like the county should consider just close down the road, not just uh, like protecting OHP people that are OHPs, because they get Donald Trump's drive on those roads. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, Cassandra Macarena. Um, okay. Um, Ron Bertolis. We're going to give people at least 10 seconds. Yes, sorry about that. <laughs> um, Ron Bertolis. Yeah, I'm here. Hey, good night. Can I speak up right here? Yeah. Um, can you speak really loud? Can I speak after everybody speaks? If I, I hear it really good. I want to hear it. Oh, okay. 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 Um, Ron Crystal Donaldson. She's outside. Yes, hi. I'm Ryan. Just want to do a sound check real quick. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. I'll keep it short and sweet to not be redundant. I think there's been a lot of good points made. A few to point out from some of the previous comments. Uh, trail maintenance. I would disagree that OE users don't provide trail maintenance. There's many organizations throughout Colorado that are specific for this, Stay the Trail, Colorado Trail Association. We, when we purchase our OHV sticker for the year, we fund those organizations and they come out with chainsaws and shovels and volunteers from the OHV community and do a lot of maintenance, not only on our trails, but on trails that we share with mountain bikers. So that's something I've done in my 30 years of life and will continue to do. In addition, when there's enduros and bigger events, I know those guys are there a week ahead of time, preparing the trail, making sure that the race won't be invasive and with minimal impact as possible. And they stay for a week after repairing anything that might've happened during the event. I think it would be a very unique opportunity for Leadville to create an ecosystem that all of the different recreations can share. You've got Salida and BV and Vail and all the surrounding ones that have embraced their recreation, whether they have a river that goes through and they support kayaking. Leadville really is specific to having a lot of trails and that's great for hikers and mountain bikers and OHVs. And I think there is a world that all of those can coexist without destroying the serenity, as somebody has mentioned. Moab is a great example of that. They, they've learned to thrive and embrace all of that. And I'm a mountain biker and dirt biker myself. And, you know, there, there's great people in this community that want to help, that want to make money and put money back into the society. Um, I don't think it's fair to oppress one group for calling out these instances where, like Ting brought up, what is the percentage of occurrences that it's an OHV related police report? And are there ones that are not bike related? I'm sure that there are. And that, that's a statistic that we don't have right now, but we can't be so narrow-minded to say this group has issues, but the others don't. I really think that we can all come together, coexist, um, and, and have a really good community. Um, the only other thing I was gonna mention was, as far as the fire mitigation goes, to get an OHV tag, your bike has to verify that you have a spark arrestor. So whether that's a dirt bike, TV, or side by side. So that's a federal law. So if somebody's breaking that, I completely agree that we should enforce 
Yep, thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Norm Lloyd. How can you hear me? Yes. I am Tom Sobel. I'm director of the Quiet Use Coalition, which is a 25 year old nonprofit organization that um, protects and creates quiet use areas on public lands as well as preserving um, natural soundscapes and wildlife habitat, and that includes um, county roads. We've been involved in this issue for over 25 years. Um, we are based in Chaffee County, but we have numerous members in, um, that live in Lake County. Um, can you hear us? Yes. You, there's a lot of uh, microphone interruption and hitting the microphone. Can you try to um, limit that? It's just making it very hard to understand you. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. As of now. <laughs> go, go ahead. Okay. Um, um, so we. Our organization is based in Chaffee County, and we have a post office. Just a few points here. Just want to point out that the um, noise, dust, pollution created by OHV use creates conflicts with other user conflicts that is that those are that is created are asymmetrical in that. OHV users don't care that much about, or they don't experience the noise, dust, pollution. It's all spewed out behind them. But other user groups on county roads, um, you know, whether in a, in a vehicle, a hiker, um, a biker, a horseback rider, or a resident of those roads, are experiencing those kinds. It's OHV users sort of like uh, smoking, where smokers don't care about second smoke but um, everybody else does. So um, um, a few things here. Um, the uh, state of Colorado, actually the, the US government has started a lot of, uh, a lot of new initiatives to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, specifically from transportation and vehicle use in order to address climate change. And it seems crazy um, and conflicting that the city of Leadville and Lake County are encouraging and facilitating OHV use, which is contrary to those goals. OHV engines are allowed by the EPA. They're not regulated like regular licensed cars and trucks. They're allowed to create a lot of, to emit a lot of particulate matter um, eight times more than car engines. And then you have the problem with, you know, instead of like four people riding in an SUV to look at all the county roads, which can be traversed the highway license vehicle, you might have four people on four ATVs, four separate engines emitting not just fumes. Um, another problem with this, as been discussed, burden that Lake that you know, Lake County is placed on other agencies. The U.S. Forest Service, BLM, private landowners, and adjacent counties where Lake County roads transition or intersect with roads open to, um, uh, that are not open to OHV use under the jurisdiction of these other agencies. And by opening Lake County roads, you're burdening these other agencies with additional enforcement education concerns, you know, to exclude county um, use from their roads. Um, like Western Pat, they, you know, Park County does not allow OHV use on any of their roads. 
and County Road 7, and I believe it's uh, uh, 22 Western Pass, Mosquito Pass, transition into Clark County Roads. Um, Thank you, Bob. Glenn Backen. 
Mike Tabor. Yes, hello everyone. This is Mike Tabor. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. I've been, uh, my wife and I have been living up here in uh, Leadville for 21 years now. And we think it's an absolute joy to have open roads for us. We're both motorbike riders and we uh, ride our dirt bikes from the house up to Hagerman Pass. We ride up to Sugarloaf Pass. Mosquito Pass is one of my favorites. My wife doesn't like it as much. <laughs> um, I think uh, my comments are that I think the commercial use people um, are doing a great job. They actually have a job to keep their people safe. They do their best to keep everybody in line and in order. Um, I heard about a lot about noise. That's my biggest thing. I think one of the comments I'd like to say is that, you know, um, we all agree that there's current laws that have to be enforced and people need to be held accountable. Noise is one of them. Speed is another. Young children running around two and three on an ATV without helmets. That's a problem. I see that. And I'm a dirt bike rider. I ride with my gear. I fall off my, my bike. You know, it weighs 270 pounds. I weigh 260 pounds. And when I fall off, it's not pretty, but I get back up. Those little kids aren't going to get back up. So I think we all agree safety is very important. Um, and noise can be controlled. There are some older bikes out there. I even heard some over at the abate uh, thing during boob days that boy, a little itty bitty bike that's a 100 is louder than some of our 400s. But basically, I'd like to keep things mostly the same. I love the idea that the county and the city are looking into plans to better improve cohabitating. I love what Crystal said. I think we can all use this. For me, riding a dirt bike, and I'm an avid skier, is just like skiing through uh, the trees. I love riding on the trails. I'm one that stays on the trails. I do not go up and look at a big tailing pile and think of it as a big jump and just tear it up. I don't think that's right. I've never done that. My wife and I, when we're on the trails in a person, a car, a horse or a dog are on the trails, we slow down to five tops, 10 miles an hour, give them space, especially with the animals like horses and dogs. You know, we give them respect. I think everybody, if we can just start with respect, we can make this all work. And I commend the uh, commercial use people for bringing that to our town. And with that, I say thank you. Thank you, Mike. Jason Kirsten from Elephant Adventures. Ann Penniston. Um, Jim Evans. Okay, um, I'm 70 years old. I'm not a grouchy old man yet, but I'm getting there. What bugs me is I have OHA vehicles, racing motorcycles. I keep them licensed just in case I want to ride them on the street. I do stupid stuff with them but I don't do it in the communities where there's kids playing. I've served on a city council in the city bigger than this county. The problem you're having is what we encounter in all cities, enforcement of the law. We don't need new laws. We need to enforce what we have. How do we do that? We can't. Where's the mayor? Right here. I've called in numerous motorcycles that aren't in my neighborhood. They're in my neighborhood. I don't talk to them. They won't chase them because of the liability. So how do we enforce those laws? Therein is the problem. Not new laws, ways to enforce what we have. Can we register the vehicles and make them have a license plate, a sign or something, so that we see them, the officers can see them and find them. Therein is the problem. The noise, we're gonna have noise. People have a right to recreation. Cut it off at a certain time. We had that down in Texas. 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and after riding the dry creek bed behind my house. We let them go until 10 o'clock, and then it's done. 
the congestion. The big problem down there is in the island towns, on the beach towns, the golf carts. You think the OHV population is bad? Wait till you're in bumper to bumper traffic with 100 golf carts, and they're getting run over. They just had four get killed in Galveston last week. It's an enforcement issue, not new laws enforcement. That's all I got, and I'm still not grouchy. <laughs> <laughs> Andy, go first. Hello. Um, so the, the 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 young the young adults, the children on the bikes is very I'm hearing them. Um, and it you know Jim just talked about enforcement, but I I think it really comes to education. And, and so I I'm, I'm involved with the motocross track, and we try to we give them free entry to the motocross track and let them uh, you know let them ride there. But we also I don't know, maybe through the sheriff's office, we could um, have some kind of vouchers that they could get to kids to say, hey, if you want to ride, come up to the track and you can ride there for free. Um, we'd be super willing to do that. Um, but it's really educating the kids. I know a lot of them, a lot of them on the ski team that I coach. Um, I'd be happy to work with the sheriff's office or anyone to try to educate the kids more on, you know, the, the fact that respect gets respect. So thank you. Tom Phillips, I've lived here my whole life, and I think what we're feeling here is we're feeling the impact of how much use we're getting out of everything. We can point out examples of bike trails that are eroded, ATV trails that are eroded. I think we go back to getting the kids off the street with the ATVs. That's annoying as all get out, and it's unsafe. They come into my place and vandalize. You can put stickers on them all you want to. They're not going to buy them. They're not buying them now, so you can't identify who the kids are. I've taken pictures of them. You can't enforce it. When you get the kids off the street, get the families out. Everybody here is a responsible user. I'm pretty sure that's why we're here. So the responsible ones are not. Those are the ones we need to go after. So, and I think we can all probably get along. Probably all use the same trails that we already do now. Julian, oh. again. Okay. Angelo Regret. Great lobby. Lots of colors right now. <laughs> three minutes, Greg. Three minutes. <laughs> Go. <laughs> Hi, John Commissioner. Uh, my name is Greg Lobby, and uh, I've been a, a motorcycle uh, rider, off road rider, and, and racer for um, my 52nd year. So I have a real investment in this. And one of the things that I really, really um, what really resonates with me with the city of Leadville is like going to the wide out of my garage and going to like the trails. And uh, I, I've heard a lot about the overuse on the east side, but I use the east side pretty consistently. And I rarely see people out there. I, I don't know what the, the disconnect here is, um, but I don't see it. That's just me personally being out there. I uh, was I was a group uh, a couple weekends ago, and we went out at 10 o'clock, there were about 10 people. And we were going back roads up to Kai Road 6, and we went over to Hawaii and everything came back, and nobody, zero. <laughs> we didn't see a soul. But that afternoon at 2, we went out, I saw one runner. And then later, we were going on the Mosquito Pass, I saw two Jeeps up high on the Mosquito Pass. And then coming back down, I saw about four side by sides. I'm not saying there's not a problem, I'm just saying I'm not seeing it personally. I don't, I don't quite understand where a lot of this is coming from. I would say to uh, to Crystal's point, you know, when I left the OHP subcommittee a little over six years ago, um, and this is the where, where all the sticker money goes, uh, and they have about five million dollars a year for trail maintenance. We had 23 paid trail crews on the ground in the state of Colorado at that time. That's not even volunteer crews. In fact, last weekend I was in South Fork helping to uh, to uh, uh, rehab some trails from an event the weekend before working with the Forest Service. 
So I think there's plenty of opportunity for responsible use of trails uh, where we're not out of the way. Um, years ago, this is about 15 years ago, if I remember correctly, uh, the county commissioners did a survey of the county and they found out two thirds of all people in the county had an OHV. Two thirds. At that time, I don't know what the number is now. And that was about the time that they opened the county roads. And then one county commissioner told me after about a year that it just wasn't an issue. Now, I'm not in that camp right this second. The reason I'm not is, is we have a cautionary tale in, in some of the communities. I think we're doing the right thing to get in front of this, not wait until it becomes a huge problem. I think your problem again is not with locals, it's with people come from outside this community and use OHVs irresponsibly. Um, that's, that's my observation in my opinion. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room, anybody, wants to see Lake County inundated with OHV. Uh, we enjoy the use of, of this, of, of our roads and trails. I think we like to keep it that way. I think the guiding, the guiding tours are the most responsible users of trails in the county. I'll leave it that. Thank you. Jeff Johnson. Jeff Johnson, and I'm here from Canada and Niagara Water. Um, our biggest issue, and this is what we really see out in the Panhard area, is the night tonighters coming in with truckloads full of off road vehicles. We have them racing around as late as one or two o'clock in the morning. We call the police by the time the sheriff gets out there and they quit for the night. Um, they make some of the roads basically race courses and then we're in for grading them to get the ruts out of the road. So it's not good. Um, I see what you're trying to do here is a very positive thing. And I applaud the outfitters for having trails and maintaining and doing things like that. But the biggest thing I see is, is to have some type of mapping like you viewed on the screen of these are places where you can go ride and not turn a subdivision into your private race course. Plus, as we go on, we're putting more water lines in and those lines now, because we do kind of straighten it up out there, now they're becoming hill courses for the dirt bikes. And they love to race down our steep hills. Uh, we have some 40, 45% grades that we're getting lines into, and they're getting thrown up by the dirt lines. So our method has been to make it as irregular as possible and actually dangerous, and which puts the Mount Echo Water Association into a liability situation because we have created hazards. But we have to do something because we are liable if somebody gets hurt on the water and they don't realize that. Thank you. Um, Rapid, sorry that you just came back in. I have a young public comment. Uh, I'm so really sorry, Bill. We'll come back to you. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name's Ross Music. Uh, I'm actually the district's sixth rep for CSA. I also sit on the Dow Pass Task Force as a voter IC. Um, I guess all I just wanted to mention was uh, I believe in the Colorado Stormland Association program greatly and how they do things and why they do things. Uh, I believe they always want to be a good partners with everybody, moto and non. Um, I believe it's a two way street that everybody, town, county, anyone in the community should always reach out to them and they'd be happy to work with you. Um, funding, you know, is uh, getting tighter. It's a total grant system on what they bring into this community. For equipment and fuel, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, I hear a lot about like uh, summer travel. Uh, I believe that there should maybe be a different winter travel travel management plan um, for just on the travel usage. And then something I've just seen over the years: uh, diversity and trailhead parking, uh, where some should be voted on for travelers and non 
that's taking place right now with uh, CDOT and Dow Pass. And diversifying routes, I've seen a lot of things in the past where travel management came in, closed a lot of areas down, and then areas get really get used a lot because that's all that, that, that is remaining in the community. So that's just um, all I have to add at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Don Seppi. I'm going to go about two minutes to you. <laughs> my name's Don Seppi, and I've lived here a long time, all my life, um, second generation here. Uh, a couple of quick things that I've changed my mind on my comments while I listen to this. I'm not going to debate who's right and wrong, but I do think the county and the city have a big task in front of them because I think you need to, one, look at facts not feelings, okay? I think, uh, and some of the statistics will validate your path that you're gonna take. I think you're not including the entire group that needs to be included. And I think you have to evaluate all groups that include mountain bikes. Uh, there's, when you talk about erosion, I can take you out in the backcountry and show you trails that are cut across private property illegally. I can show you in the backcountry where mountain bikes have done hill drops and just he wrote ribbit after ribbit because as soon as it gets dropped, they move over one, and I can show you that stuff. So it's not just motorized vehicles. The other thing I want to stress is you've got to categorize it. I have a street legal dirt bike. The law allows me to ride it on e road. So if I do say I can't take my side by side out, it doesn't change a thing because I can take my licensed vehicle anywhere I want to on a road. And you can't really stop me, it's a public road. Can't stop me. The other thing is, you have to realize we have a lot of public roads and private property. I would question what that aren't maintained by the county. I would question on what authority the county would have to stop access on public roads through private property. So, in a nutshell, I would really think I would want, I'm willing to be involved in this as we have these meetings, but the county really needs to do a full assessment of who they need to be looking at. They need to look at facts, not feelings. And then they also need to look at the categories and what categories you can truly control. Because you can shut up all the, I mean, I go out almost every weekend on my bike on my side by side. And I see very few people, but I see a lot more four wheel drive licensed vehicles than I ever see on licensed vehicles, whether that's motorcycle, Jeeps, whatever you want to talk about. I see Jeep groups that have 25, 30 vehicles in a row. So you can do some changes. But it might not impact what you think because it's not all user groups are being considered in this. I just ask you to really look at the facts, keep us all involved. I'm a business owner. I do make money on the ATV usage. I get a lot of guests come back here because they love the fact they can ride from my campground and don't have to take their 35 foot toy haul or fifth wheel out of my campground, park it in the middle of nowhere, and try and turn it around. Okay, so. We all, all us business people in my county, helps make we help we are helped to make a living, not just the outfitters, all of us that have private businesses in my county benefit from people visiting us. And that's our income. Thank you. Thank you. No comment. Okay. No comment. I can't remember. Is it Ronnie or Donnie Duran? Donnie Duran. Yeah, I remember Donnie Duran. No, there's no way you got his name. And I can't read the first name. Dr. Duran. Now, basically, uh, Mike Cave would pretty well covered everything that I was going to bring up, too. So, again, Don said we should have added some stuff to that. Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, Cooper Malazzi. Evening, Commissioners. Uh, most of my comments were covered. I just appreciate the beginnings of this conversation and some method of looking at a greater picture recreation management plan of the whole county um, and, and all venues. Um, I really think it's important to explore this stuff, whether it's commercial, private, or both. One piece that um, Ross mentioned was. The winter time bike management when it comes to motorized and non-motorized and the greens trails um, that I think needs uh, additional consideration. 
Um, I, I, I don't fault any user group. I don't think there's any individual out there um, that's trying to muck up the works. So you have to just recognize the sheer facts that the bigger the item in the implement and the greater the horsepower of any motor that is motorized, the greater the impact, no matter what that impact is, the noise, pollution, emissions, uh, the carbon footprint of creating said piece, the torque, um, the trailer erosion that goes with it. Uh, bikes do the same, feet do the same. They just do it at different levels. Um, and so by which if we want to maintain the environmental uh, enjoyment we all get out of the place in terms of peace and solitude and fun and recreation, uh, there just needs to be a balanced scale of how those all play together um, in a synergistic manner. Um, the, the impacts we see are not necessarily direct, they're not usually conflict in my opinion. Uh, they have more to do with everything I just mentioned, noise, safety, environmental protection, emissions, that sort of thing. Um, and so I really hope we can find a way to do that because uh, the regulation we have in place can't be enforced. And if we're going to do more regulations, great, but how are we going to actually enforce them? Right? The, the machines themselves aren't necessarily the problem. The riders themselves aren't really the problem. But when you have the irresponsible rider on a really powerful machine, then you have a problem. Right? And how do we manage that individual? And I think Andy brought it up pretty well in terms of the education piece and having some other guidelines in place for a responsible recreation in the county. Um, our commercial entities can help do that work possibly. Uh, but maybe you can a task force while on the trails, group representatives and students are doing all that thing, which I think they're doing already. Uh, those are just some of the thoughts I had. Uh, but I appreciate the conversation. I look forward to continuing down the road. No fun. Uh, Peter Day. Hi, Peter. Um, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Um, I'm Day. I'm also, um, I live on 27 Days Drive and also president of the Grand West Estate Owners Association. And that's the subdivision along County Road 99. Um, you know, I want to talk about incentives and, and disincentives. Disincentives, that's a, you know, enforcement. You know, we're limited in terms of police and sheriffs. Um, I don't even bother to call the sheriff, uh, you know, anymore for trespass because, you know, they got more important things to do. So, so there may be underreporting for people. People don't bother anymore. Um, incentives, um, you know, having more places for trailer parking would be helpful. Um, Leadville Junction, um, there's big parking coming lot down there. They used to be a place where people would come and unload their their um, snowmobiles and then go on the Turquoise Lake Trail. That that lot's pretty much been appropriated by White, White Mountain Tours. That whole lot can be parked up just with cars, and there is no room for anybody to bring their, you know, their trailer. So I don't know whether the county, whether that's a county permitted operation there to use the parking lot for their, for their tour parking. Um, they don't have any other parking except for the county lot. So, so I encourage you to have a look at, look at what their permit, permit allows. Um, there are also things that could be done right now that the county could do. If you're interested in protecting county proper, private property, you could uh, put signs up along, you know, at that Blackfield Junction parking lot and say no snowmobiles beyond this sign. You know, we get a lot of incursions, but Climax property as well, the gravel pit, a lot of use in there. I know Climax doesn't like it. You know, and then we we butt up. Um, you know, the Grand West Owners Association property butts up against Climax and goes all the way up the East Fork of the uh, uh, the Arkansas River to Highway 24. And so, so we got lots of incursions in there. So signs would be would be helpful. You know, some education. County Road 99. That's a road to nowhere. You know, it tees into into uh, State Highway 24. So there should be no access for unlicensed vehicles because state law would prohibit you know that use on on, on state highways. So you know, again, that that's enforcement. You know, we shouldn't see any you know any traffic from unlicensed vehicles on County Road 99. That's about it. You know, I think my message is there are things that we must then have. I think it's a good idea to, you know, to have a look at the ordinance, but you know, but deal with uh, the current situations and use the tools that you have available to you right now. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, we are at the end of our list. Um Sheriff Stegman, you still here? Yes. Can, can you talk to us just a little bit about the enforcement piece or um, yeah, and we've had a lot of comments on that, so if you want to look, you could just discuss a little bit. Three minutes, I don't know if I'll be <laughs> okay. I, I think that's yeah. what Caleb was playing. Okay. Yeah, 
I think uh, it's great to hear everybody. There's a lot of good comments there, uh, and, and I'm sure they're all being considered uh, if there's any change to the ordinance. Uh, I, I agree that the largest issue here is the enforcement factor. A lot of this stuff is just illegal activity uh, that we need to address. Um, I encourage you guys to keep calling it in. I'll pass this information on along that, yeah, we're not going to assume the liability and danger issues, but that doesn't mean that we don't respond. So there's a change in culture that we're going through in this office, and I encourage you guys to keep reporting that to us, and we'll, we'll get to it. So we'll get to this. We'll try to figure out who parents are uh, for the kid issue. I think that's the biggest problem, in my opinion, is having kids rip around. If they're not using it completely, they might be like everybody else in this room, I believe, is using it responsibly. They're just using it to transfer themselves from, from wherever to wherever, not the recreation use. So uh, we do plan on improving staffing levels to help address these types of issues. Um, okay, we have just a couple more comments to read into the record. Um, yeah, just one minute, Jim. We've got one more comment to read into the record. Um, do you have a comment or a question for the sheriff? Yes. Yeah. Um, here's the deal. I grew up on military bases as a kid and as an adult. Parenting was an issue. So if a child, this four-year-old kid, is blasted down Mount Massive on a dirt bike, you pull him over. What do you do with the kid? Or do you go back and hold the parents responsible for not parenting properly? I mean, that's what happened on the military base. My kid screws up. I'm the brother commander explaining why my kid did this stupid stuff. That's correct. So are, are we doing that? Or what do you do with the, with the minor? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's to the parents. So we'll get with the rule address the parents and we'll figure out who these kids are. Um, as for the past, I'm not sure if that's been done to this point, but mm -hmm. My short time on the today happened. So we were able to find who the parents are, the kids are, and we were able to address it to the parents. Okay, thank you. We don't have any city commanders, so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask a question? Yes, please. And it's more of the city, but it's law enforcement. So if we made it illegal in the city, would the quantity of violations go down just because it was illegal? Right, yeah. yeah. I, 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 I feel bad for I gotta show you my video. Yeah, but nonetheless, here's the issue. Everything that you're seeing is already illegal. And yeah. we talked about enforcement. It comes down to how do you catch these kids? Okay, there, there's a lot of creative ways to catch the kids. Okay? <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but I, I, can, I can list you like three or four. We don't need to go into that, but if if you made it illegal to start with, I think 75% of it would go over. No. If if at that point you started to enforce it with creative ways, I think the rest of it would go down. When I met with you and Commissioner Ordonia and Chief Glennie and Sheriff Fensky, you guys said it was going to be 15 miles an hour. You said we were going to enforce it. You said let's point to point. And um, and I was just like, well, we'll see. And in five years, it's gotten tremendously worse. So um, what I think has happened is social media has made it like, hey, just run from the cops. They're not going to chase you. Go faster, and you'll lose them. And there's no enforcement. Okay, so I I can talk to you on the side about some other ways to enforce it, but I do believe making it illegal in the city would stop. 75%. Then, then, then the, the other ways. And then I'm not talking about the county and all the rules for the county. I, I think that needs to be addressed too. But within the city, I just can't believe how much I see daily. So let me let me just let me get completed. This is that yeah, we have a address more, it to the board. We have a couple more comments for you, so uh, I think you know, the position on laws is we'll have some people who will we'll see on see on it. A little deceiver. There are some people who may be a little peer pressure. They're like on the mineral boat. You see somebody who's doing something, you know, we actually have people on the mineral boat. You see somebody, maybe a, a, a scholar type that says, hey, I'm going to be mineral, there's a few people on there, maybe you can slow down. So there's the people who automatically do it. Then there are people who do it if, if they're suggested to do it by non law enforcement. And then there are people who we law enforcement to tell them to do it. And there are other categories of people who decide to do it. So, you know, if we pass a law, will they eliminate it? 
No, because that they're category. Okay, so let me let me let me tell you some good news. Uh, last Friday, uh, the police department graduated two recruits from the police officer training academy. The sheriff's department had uh, two candidates as well. So as far as enforcement, uh, when the police department had one and a half police officers, one and a half. You tell me how we cover 24 hours with one and a half police officers. We're in a much better position now. So as far as enforcement, we are we are in better position with the resources we have now. Um, and I'm happy to share uh, the uh, uh, police chief this morning with some ideas about how we can do this when we're not going to say something. Not going to reveal our secrets. I know. But, but when I'm going to tell you, they're always doing it. They're always and I and, and I talked about the resources. We're working on the resources. The sheriff's department is working on the resources. So uh, I just want to let you know we 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 don't we are we haven't forgotten about your concerns and we've seen we've seen them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just have one minute question. Would you guys consider, um, even if I showed you a route, there's been a bunch of camping going on on each side, and pretty much the only close calls we've had are from the people just not respecting Leadville. I think their Leadville might be turning into a cool little place you can camp for free and speed around, and I don't want that uh, reputation to get out for Leadville, uh, not only for my neighbors, but also bit. So the only close call we had is from campers, and I can show you a route that goes up seven, crosses over, and comes down and fit. There's like no off-roading involved. Your trucks would make it easy, and I can point out everywhere they can. And I think if you guys could just do a loop, maybe Friday after 5 p.m., and maybe a Saturday morning loop, and just kind of clear them out. You know, we like we said we're trail ambassadors, we're like, hey, you know. Supposed to camp there, but you know, they have their toy holder set up and it, they're almost treating it like you know, it's just it's not good. And I was just wondering if there's any room for patrolling the east side, just one little loop, it would take maybe 10 minutes in total leaving from town. And if you'd let me show it to you, that would be possible. Yeah, let's do that. Let me clarify what you just pointed out here. The only actually yeah. so there's other issues going on there, so I'd be happy to go. Awesome. Yeah, Anybody want to stick to the schedule? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let me get another two minutes to talk about the east side. Um, yeah, we got more comments to go through quickly and then um, we can discuss more. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, Brian Tapped online and then we'll come back to Ron Bertolis and Tim has one also to go through right there. Um, Emily, yes. um, we'll come to you at the very last one. Ryan, do you want to have a comment? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Um, I grew up in Buena Vista, Colorado, and uh, graduated from high school there, and worked very hard to uh, move to the front range, make an income to finally buy a house here in Lake County in Leadville. And, and I chose this area for the recreational activities that are involved in the community and how the community is growing and developing. Um, what I really want to bring to the table here is that we have heard a lot of complaints and comments, but are we really discussing any solutions? And are we discussing the unintended consequences of the directions we go? I understand that we don't like these bikes riding on the east side. I personally really enjoy that aspect of the community. But an unintended consequence of banning that would be, where are we gonna put all these pickup trucks and trailers? And when those people are not on the trail, they're gonna bring all those trailers and pickup trucks and take up our city parking and the parking that's in front of people's houses that we need. So there's unintended consequences on either side of this. Once those trailers stay at home, they aren't needed. Maybe they're in that gentleman's campground. The other side, they're out on our streets when they're eating dinner or they're blocking the road as soon as they do have the privilege of going into the into a proper OHV areas. Um, another point is we're not alone in this. You have Silverton having this discussion, Moab's having this discussion. Um, there are many small towns, and I think that we should look at those systems that are that are already in place and see what's working and what's not working about them. 
Another point is first aid access. I've personally been out on the trail as a mountain biker in Moab and been injured. And it was an OHE rider that rode me out of that trail. And I was eight miles in. Um, if, if I didn't have that OHE counterpart to that, um, it would have been a long, lonely haul to get my own broken body out of that country. Um, tourism is a major factor. We don't have the rafting in this community. And I think that that's something that we should try to understand and, and build our community to fit other tourism models. Um, but I, I think all in all, our number one concern is for the quality of life of people that live here, right? And that's what we need to focus on and being good stewards to each other. Um, that's all I have. I hope that uh, you guys consider those things and that we look to others and other communities that are already dealing with these problems or have dealt with them so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, Robert Bullock? Yeah, can you speak really loudly? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I agree with everybody's uh, thing. It's, it's a hard thing to figure out. One of the things is, first off, I can tell you right now, these kids will outrun these cops. You'll we'll have a cop uh, crash a cop car. I've seen it 32 years ago. But anyhow, um, I think the biggest problem is, is there's no support of kids to do in Lake County or Leadville. And the other problem is, is there's no other direction but to go down, I think it's Tom Phelps' road, to cut over, to get over there to that uh, riding track. I've went back there several times just to see there's a lot of kids that ride that track back there, more cross track. Well, they have to come back through town. And I've seen them, they, they fly to Tom Grove. You know, but I think educating them is the biggest issue. I also don't think that uh, Don's ATV thing with the six machines is really going to cause much of a problem, especially if they come out now. And for some people like me, that would be the only way I can get up to the mountains. You know, I can walk up that far. I can't ride a bike. As a matter of fact, I can't ride a UTV. But you know, for some people, they have, that's one way they can get up. So that's that's everybody's got to get on the mountains. Um, Tim, if you want to read your comment into the record, and we'll go back. Uh, sorry for comment from Aaron Kelts. I wish I could attend this meeting, but I have a prior commitment. I would like to submit my opinion. Feel free to read at the meeting. Something that I think the Board of County Commissioners needs to consider before writing any new laws concerning the OHV use on County Road is that many long-time Leadville and Lake County residents enjoy being able to travel from their homes to their many miles of trails that surround our town. What may not be as obvious is that many of these same residents don't have access to a trailer to haul their bikes or ATVs, or are unable to, work, are unable to afford a vehicle that is capable of hauling a trailer. Some of these residents may either be using their ATV or dirt bike as a transportation option to get to and from work or the grocery store when their primary vehicle breaks down. Another point to consider is that not everyone is capable or able, due to health reasons or age, to ride a bike or walk to some of the more remote and scenic areas around Leadville. For them, no ATV may be the only way that they get to recreate outdoors. With these points in mind, a lot of aims responsible OHV be riding on county roads could put, could put an undue burden on those already struggling in an area where housing costs and inflation have been skyrocketing these past few years. I believe it will also make it harder for some residents to get outside and enjoy the outdoors. For these reasons, I would propose a lot banning OHV use on county roads. And that was from Aaron Kelt. Uh, from Susan D. Roebuck. The era of frequent OHV use in our mountains and in our public lands needs to come to an end. The reasons are OHVs are not healthy transportation. Kids grow up thinking nature is for this kind of use, and many may be missing out on everything else our natural places have to offer. OHVs burn fossil fuels and are loud and disruptive in nature. Some, some OHV users do not stay on the trail, and some prolifically make new trails where none should be, causing erosion. It burns extra fossil fuels to haul OHVs and trail behind a pickup truck. The burning of this much fossil fuel by one person is not a great ratio in terms of resource use per person. Multiply this by the number of people in our country that use 
more than this, it's sustainable. And one can begin to see there will be consequences. Uh, we cannot sustain that sort of ratio. Resources are not actually limitless. OHVs take away from the experience of everyone else in nature. OHVs can be stressful for wildlife. Some OHV users harass wildlife. So let's get ahead and keep many of the existing roads and trails that OHVs use, but let's make OHVs OHV, OHV use mainly for people over 65 or people with handicaps. We don't need to keep encouraging this high impact recreational trend that does not promote physical health for the person and damages the health of the land. Susan Robarts. And then last uh, from Anne Marie Holwin. I understand the county commissioners will be revisiting the 2012 decision to allow unlicensed OHVs on all eight county roads. I live in Chaffee County, but I hike and cross country ski cross country ski frequently in Lake County. I love Leadville and surrounding areas. I do not love seeing, hearing, breathing dust from OHVs on county roads. Only some of the users are local. Others haul their vehicles in from Texas or else wear and tear up the roads here in Colorado. Encountering OHVs everywhere makes a bad impression of the town, in my opinion. Perhaps that is why we hear neighboring counties generally prohibit OHV use on all county roads. We also know that many OHV users tend to be young and not terribly responsible. Some of them will drive from a road where OHVs are allowed and onto other areas, including grass and tundra, where they are not allowed. I've seen this myself. I greatly appreciate caring citizens who run for office and will try to do their best for the people they serve. I worked for local government in Alaska for 10 years in the city manager's office. I know that issues and decisions are not always clear cut, but I do hope that Lake County policymakers will look at the OHVs here again and decide to place more limits. And that was from Anne Marie Bowen. Um, uh, I'll try to speak loud enough. Um, <laughs> Uh, Emily Olson, I'm the executive director of Cloud City Conservation Center. Um, we own and operate the farm on 6th and Mpati, um, where there is an unofficial OHV trail uh, that crosses by the mineral belt. Um, and I know that that is city land, not county. However, it is used quite frequently for point A to point B travel. Um, and we came to both the city and the county uh, two years ago because we have students on the farm uh, every day. Uh, we have my farm staff, um, the county, the city, our community members invested to build our farm. And um, OHVs come through our property at well above 30 miles per hour. Um, it's incredibly dangerous to them, to students, to my staff. It filled in our ditch and has created extreme drainage issues on our farm. We built a fence. Um, Someone came and took it down and used it to block our driveway. Um, we tried to go to OHV groups to address this and no one would help us. So we now have a much larger fence. Um, hopefully no one will take it down. Um, and I will say um, a lot of the groups, OHV groups in town, um, do come to our community cleanup. They help us pull trash out of the east side. Um, and they do come and support us. Um, but trying to close that trail was incredibly difficult. Um, and it was really, really dangerous for my staff, for students on the farm. Um, it's really caused issues on our farm. And um, I just think that's something we have to take into um, consideration is, you know, how do we really reach? Um, I, and I honestly, I would say it was local rider. Um, a lot of them I had conversations with. Um, and uh, yeah, how do we make sure that people's private property is protected, that our environment is protected, that our community members are protected. Um, and I, I want to find a solution between everyone. I think one exists. I'm glad we're having this conversation tonight. Um, but I did just want to add to the conversation that um, I don't think it's all tourists. And I, I think it has been really difficult to have conversations like this before tonight. Thank you all. Okay, Dan, if you quickly want to make a, a comment about the inside. Yeah, this would be about the concern of people from outside the community coming to recreate in Leadville. Um, as far as using the east side and Leadville in general, some feedback I've had um, even before I moved here. And 
We've invited all our friends with UTDs. It's, I love Leadville, but the feedback for people with side-by-sides is it's just not really conducive to the type of recreating because it's so small. We kind of bump on no quarters. I mean, we traverse the east side doing 20 miles an hour in under 20 minutes. We go from left to right. People with side-by-sides really don't want to do that. There's not people from Texas coming here to ride in Leadville. There's really not a lot of trailhead parking. I saw a kind of one organized type ride in Leadville. It might have consisted of 10 machines. They came and they never came back. Uh, that's just kind of the feedback for the type. You know, it's not just the east side. It's also Hagerman Pass. Once you get up to Frying Pan Road, you're not allowed to drive there. Lake County is cool because we live here and we can drive our buggies and our dirt bikes to go do nice things and I appreciate the beauty. But uh, yeah, my friends have never come and visited me again. They won't hold their buggies here. It's just not a place like Silverton or Moab that you can recreate for hours on end. It's just not that big and I don't think that's really going to be an issue here. I mean, of course it's cool to have foresight and think into the future and stuff like that, but I don't really think Leadville is going to become that place. And of course, there's issues of noise in town. I mean, we're at the motel. There's crappy cars with no exhaust that drive up and down the road all day. There's noise everywhere. Um, but you know, I don't know what to do. But I, I don't think OHVs are really the issue in Leadville. That's what I would say. Get to the trash, get to go down on ATVs. 
um, whatever you want to call it. So it's not that we're against them. We just want to have a degree of enforcement when they come from the outside. Something that we can hand them and say, these are the rules, don't raise in the community, um, and then have the law enforcement enforcement or unit. And that's what we're after. We're not trying to ban them from the ban uh, because we just use them all the time, but we drive the response to And that's what I hear from the outfitters, that they do it responsibly. And I've heard that from many of the people just sitting in the audience tonight as, you know, but I think that everybody's just after some structure to follow to help enforce it and not tear up a big thing. Thanks. Um, Bob, do you want to go quickly and then we'll close up our public comments and then we'll talk about next steps? I'm sorry, I didn't have to finish or the kind of. Uh, one of the points that I learned is that the traditional use permit for these guide groups here goes through the city. Now, I don't really understand that because, <clears throat> and I don't know what the conditional use permit is for the city, but uh, they are using the county. And they're using the industrial mine here. Now, I had a business that worked in the industrial mine years ago, and I had to go through a conditional use permit. And you talk about being drove back and forth through the coals. It took me like eight or nine months to get that passed through. It was no fun. Believe me, I had to. I mean, we even got down to the last days telling me I needed a stop sign and I needed the correct ADA toilet for people. You know, I mean, there was a lot of regulations that the town put on. <clears throat> but in the same sense, I think it's correct what Dan from the uh, ATV tours is saying. I don't think it's a lot of people from out of town. I think it's people that live around here mostly. I really do. Um, and I can attest to that by kind of noise, you know, where it comes from and where I hear it. And then the one last issue that I didn't really get a chance to address is kind of the dust, you know, um, <clears throat> it can be just absolutely atrocious. And I've seen the ATV tour go by the mine property just last week, and there is a dust cloud. I don't know why people want to ride behind and be just enveloped in that dust. You know, if that's what you want to do, if that's what's fun, go for it, you know. But it just really does it too. So, those are my points, Diana. Thanks. Okay. Um, is there anybody else in the room that would like to make a comment? <clears throat> okay. All right. Um, so for next step, can you um, kind of talk about what we'll do next? We'll just have a first session. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think uh, from here, after like, based off of everyone's feedback, the county and the staff will continue to do. More research and come up with proposals for the uh, Board of County Commissioners to consider. There'll probably be another one or two work sessions and then a public regular meeting for them to make their decision. There's potential for a joint meeting with City Council. Um, so, one of them. Um, but I would say there's probably going to you know, there'll be more opportunity for everyone to provide their feedback. Um, and then, like I said, we'll develop proposals for the, for the board to consider. And now, and you can. Always continue to send feedback to me or to staff or to the commissioners, and we'll keep compiling it that way as well. Yes. Um, there will be additional opportunities for public input and public feedback um, going forward through this process. So, this isn't um, like we'll take the feedback that we heard here and create the policy. Um, it'll be a little longer of a process. So, we'll continue to gather that information and data um, as we go through the process. Sarah, or Jeff, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I'd just like to thank you everybody for coming out and participating and giving your feedback. Um, I want to assure you, you know, the list of things that I'm sure we all have written down on local use versus commercial use versus outside commercial use coming in versus outside individual uses coming in, um, the infrastructure piece, the enforcement piece. This is conversations that staff and this board are well aware of balancing. Um, and when we talk about the user conflict and or what that you know realistic ratio of the impact of all users are, we are considering that. And we're trying to uh, this group of folks up here definitely 
would both put anything in place without doing our best to compensate and or provide something like early infrastructure for parking areas um, or other alternatives. So um, I appreciate the feedback and I think that uh, if you know any of these folks and want to reach out further, please please feel free to. I also would love a joint city work session because <laughs> it sounds like there's a lot of this year. You know, I also get a law enforcement and PD uh, even more into the conversation. Thank you, Sheriff Beckman, for, for standing up here and taking questions. Um, but I think that seems like a real big safety issue, um, plus the environmental impacts that you know really can't, uh, those are hard to come back from um, once impacted, and our infrastructure is really hard to keep up with. And I think this is definitely, you know, as we look at creating a special use permitting process that would likely be an annual review, this OHV and this ordinance is kind of a living and something that can and will and should change as conditions, you know, as we experience the long-term effects or impacts of whatever we may put in place, um, or we might not see those impacts. So um, I know I. I feel that this board is pretty thoughtful and um, dedicated to looking that over and really making sure that what we are doing is actually meeting the intent uh, or the problem and then making changes in time. Yeah, thanks. Just because I wanted to say, I wasn't sure how nice time all was going to go. So thanks to everyone who took uh, out of their lives, um, but also for the respectful, thoughtful time. It's really helpful for me and for. For us at the DOCC, so again, thanks for everyone for not yelling at each other or us. Um, uh, and then, second, I think um, maybe following up from, from Commissioner Mudge's comments, I think you know, just we focus on the county ordinance of county growth. There's you know, there's probably lots of different tools and lots of ideas I've heard today. There's lots of different problems and probably lots of different tools and mechanisms for addressing them. And the county ordinance is, is not going to solve all the problems, you know, whatever tweaks we may or may not. So again, just to make the point that this might not be like one policy to come down, you know, um, to, to address everything we heard tonight. And sorry to tag on that, um, but the, the, the frustration and comments about some of the subdivision activity, um, I think needs to needs to figure out who the right people are to talk to about that issue here. Uh, specific subdivision because a lot of the subdivision roads are not actually adopted as town roads, or at least some of the ones we discussed tonight. Um, Jeff, I know you're well aware, but uh, that that is um, maybe just an overall conversation to really have with law enforcement to see what and how um, that support can be. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Just uh, as a adding on to my fellow commissioners' um, time points, I think. What we're all here for is to come to an agreement on recreation use um, for multiple user groups um, and be respectful of each other and, and each user group. Um, so to come to a collaborative approach on educating people about how to use recreation resources within our community um, and how to respect one another. So I, I look forward to that collaborative approach to any kind of policy or decision that would be made in the future. Um, so thank you all so much for coming tonight. Um, our cell phone numbers and email addresses are on the county website. Um, if you'd like to call, text, or email, um, our staff is also on there. Tim's is also on there. So um, we encourage you to keep that open line of communication. And if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to add in the future, just continue to send us So um, with that, we'll go ahead and adjourn this evening at 7:50. So thank you so much for coming. They are.